Are Michael Davis and Asante Samuel Jr. both fighting for the same starting cornerback spot? Today we are updating the biggest Chargers training camp battles after preseason week one. You are Locked On Chargers, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Chargers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up and welcome into the Locked On Chargers podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Wade, joined as always by my co-host, David Drogemeyer. And we've been covering the Chargers together now for over six seasons. But we're heading into our fifth season as the host of the Locked On Chargers podcast, bringing you your team every day. Thank you guys so much for making us your first listen today. And to make sure you never miss the show, go subscribe to the Locked On Chargers YouTube channel. And also follow the show for free on all platforms every day, wherever you get your podcast from. But David Today, I wanted to get into some of these position battles because yesterday we talked about, you know, who really stood out in the Chargers first preseason game. But I think there's still a lot of conversation to be had about the position battles that really saw maybe some separation in some cases and not so much in other cases. But I think one thing that we did at least see from this first game or at least think about is, hey, maybe this competition between Michael Davis and Asante Samuel Jr. really is open to be won by one of these two dudes with Bryce Callahan and JC Jackson both sitting out. It seems like both of their spots are secured. Maybe that is something that really should be, you know, talked about a little bit more, but it's not just that because there was also a big battle at right tackle and we got to see some snap snaps from Storm Norton and Trey Pipkin. So we'll talk about that and how the defensive line competition is going to this point. Braden Fehoko, stock up. Morgan Fox, stock up. Jerry Tillery, stock down so far in the preseason. Then we'll also talk about the wide receiver position with some really interesting battles going on there. But David, it starts with the cornerback position because yes, there are some spots at the bottom of the roster that are to be had by guys like Jasir Taylor and Dean Leonard. But maybe we haven't talked enough or maybe we kind of just gave Asante Samuel Jr. that starting role automatically. But obviously by Brandon Staley's metric, both those dudes were out there playing for something. Yeah, I mean, this is something that just coming into training camp, we already kind of had Asante Samuel Jr. just penciled in as the star. Foregone conclusion. Yeah, sure. just thought it, that that's that's the way it was going to be. And maybe it still and, is, right? And I yeah, mean, maybe that still is. Maybe we're reading into this a little bit too much. But, you know, looking at, you know, what these guys did in the preseason game, they played the same amount of snaps. They played 26 snaps apiece. So they were on the field the same amount. And so it just kind of makes you feel like, okay, maybe this is more of a competition than we originally thought. Well, and if it is a competition, Michael Davis played the better of the two of those guys in that preseason game. I mean, he had a couple of nice, strong physical tackles, Yeah, had a pass breakup, had a reception that he only allowed one reception for four yards. Probably could have had another one, but the receiver barely couldn't get one foot down in a really long crossing route where he was chasing the dude all the way across the field. But <laughs> I came away very impressed with Michael Davis. Yeah. And I think part of the thing that played into, you know, our thoughts on that position battle is just that. What we saw from Michael Davis, obviously, last year, distractions or whatever the case was, it wasn't nearly good enough, right? And yeah. Asante Samuel Jr. at his best was easily the better of those two players. But it also doesn't factor in the second half of Asante Samuel Jr.'s season where he came back from his second concussion last year and wasn't really the same. I do think he's a better fit for Brandon Staley's system. I think he has the better short area quickness to go man-to-man coverage if he needs to. But it does seem like it's open. And although I do feel like, you know, this is more of a competition than maybe that we let on. I still think Asante Samuel Jr. comes away with it, but through one preseason game, I mean, it still seems like it's open, and it would seem like if it is open, Michael Davis could actually be winning. I mean, Asante Samuel Jr. was the guy who was getting all those first-team reps throughout most of the training camp so far. Towards the end of training camp, though, Michael Davis was getting those first-team reps. We know Brandon Staley has really praised his improvement a lot, but we also know that Brandon Staley loves himself some Asante Samuel Jr. So I still think he wins out, but I I do think it is a competition right now. But, you know, this is just great for the Chargers, period. The fact that Michael Davis is coming out here, a guy who struggled quite a lot last year, didn't really understand the assignments, admittedly, you know, didn't really understand the defense fully and, you know, was given a laundry list of things to improve upon. Uh, going into the offseason and by all accounts so far 
he has taken that list and he has checked each of those off. At least he has put the work in to try to eliminate those deficiencies from his game. So a better version of Michael Davis, a guy who, you know, got rewarded with a new contract a couple of years ago. If that guy comes back, that's only a benefit for the Chargers. Yeah, and we saw Michael Davis a little bit in the slot in this game, which is not something they play with a lot. And we also know that they've been looking for other rules for Michael Davis, like coming in as the money backer, right, on third and longs and things like that. So I do think that kind of tells you, hey, they want to try to find a way to get this guy on the field. But they're also kind of building packages around, at least in that sense, Asante Seema Jr. being the other, you know, starting outside corner opposite of J.C. Jackson. I still think that's the way it plays out. Asante Samuel Jr., is uber talented and is Absolutely. feisty and has all the things you need to compete at this level and I think is the better tackler when both of them are right. But it obviously is one of those things where, hey, Asante Samuel Jr. still does have a lot to prove in this league. Asante Samuel Jr. does need some live game reps to really get to where he needs to be for this defense to, ach- defense to achieve the lofty goals and expectations that they have for themselves, right? Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. He's a second-year cornerback, a second-round pick. He was never a for-sure thing, but we absolutely loved what we saw from him. Very excited from what we're going to see in year two. Unfortunately, the one big moment he had in this game was a deep pass where he ends up getting a defensive pass interference by not getting his head around. I mean, they might have called it just you know for having his arms around the receiver. Both of the guys had their arms on each other. But when you don't turn your head around, David, a key theme for this entire game, I mean, bad things are going to happen. And that was the case for not only Sante Samuel Jr., but Dean Leonard as well, and even with, you know, Dean Leonard's struggles, even with Jasir Taylor kind of winning just by not losing, you know, as the six-round cornerback in this game, by not being Dean Leonard, he kind of won in that sense. I still think I'm not writing either of those guys off. I still think they could be in competition for Tavon Campbell, who didn't end up playing in this game because he was hurt, and then also Kamon Hall, who did play in this game. Now, none of them really did anything to separate themselves, so I still think those rookies in this position battle are still in the race somewhat. Yeah, for sure. And for for Jazir Taylor, I mean, he did his job, right? I mean, there's only one situation towards the goal line where he had a, a very good opportunity to square up on the ball carrier and didn't yeah. get him on the ground. Unfortunately, Emeka Igbule was was there as well. But, you know, the running back just bounced off of him and, you know, fell into the end zone for a touchdown. But that's pretty much the only thing, you know, that, that stuck out as far as, you know, something that could be improved upon. But for Dean Leonard, I still saw a lot of things that I liked. Totally. Uh, what I want to see in the second preseason game is the adjustments. That's what I'm looking for. I want to see that he was able to, you know, the coaches were able to put together his tape where they were able to dissect that and prove upon that. So supply some things to help him get better and to turn his head around to locate the football. I want to see those improvements in the second preseason game. It's definitely not anywhere close to over right now. They had to make those mistakes so they can get better. This is just the beginning of their journey. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's one thing to make the mistakes, right? It's another to repeat the mistakes. But the exactly. other thing is, is what thing that we have heard from this coaching staff is, that's one thing they like about both these dudes, right? Is the ability to come back from a mistake. And obviously, Dean Leonard had a laundry list, and he has a lot of improvements that he can make. But like I said on yesterday's show, it's hard to find dudes who can cover. But yeah. this position group is much deeper. Your two, no doubt about it, starters from last year, Michael Davis and Asante Samuel Jr., seem to be battling out, at least in some sense, right, four snaps on the field and, and getting more snaps in Brandon Staley's defense because they probably need it. But I think at the end of the day, David, these are all good problems to have, right? And it does seem like great problems. They they were all very connected, especially early on with that, you know, second team defense, so to speak. But there were a ton of other position battles that I think we did see some separation. And then at right tackle, there wasn't as much separation. I do think one of the tackles between Storm Norton and Trey Pipkins played a little bit better. Still think that competition is wide open. And Morgan Fox, there's no doubt about it, made some separation with the guy he's going up against. Jerry Tillery, who didn't have his best game in the first preseason game after not playing in the preseason at all in 2021. But, David, I think that's something, I mean, that's going to continue to play out, and we're going to get into where everyone kind of ranks at the right tackle position and the defensive line position coming up right after this. But I do need to tell you guys about something I've been taking every day, and it's AG1 from Athletic Greens. Our next partner has a product that I always use. I started taking AG1 because I heard about it on a podcast and thought it would be a great source of energy, and I also like the thought of getting all the nutritional value without having to take a bunch of pills or supplements, whatever it is. With one scoop of delicious AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole whole food-sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, 
your nervous system, your immune system, your energy recovery, and focus. I've been taking AG1 now for a couple of months, and I've really noticed that I've been much more alert. And it also has helped me a lot with sleeping, because obviously doing a show like this and working a full-time job, I don't get a lot of it, and I've been sleeping much better. I've been feeling much more rested when I wake up since I've been taking AG1. I definitely highly recommend it. And one great thing about it, it's lifestyle-friendly. Whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, this contains one gram or less of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, no artificial anything, which is something that's hard to come by these days, while still tasting good, and it supports better sleep quality, and it supports the recovery and mental clarity that you need. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with a convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. It really is easy. I mean, it's not going to add much to your daily routine. I can promise you that. No need for a million different pills or supplements to look out for your health. Athletic Greens right now is going to give you guys a one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs all for free with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash NFL Network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash NFL Network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, David, well, we talked about the cornerback position, which is a bigger battle than I think we thought it would be. You know, not something that we thought would be leading the show for sure. <laughs> Probably thought we were going to be talking mostly about the right tackle situation because we got to yep. see both of those dudes, Trey Pipkins and Storm Norton, take live bullets at a position that's absolutely going to be crucial for the Chargers in 2022 because it is their biggest question mark on offense. And neither one of those guys has shown consistent extended success by any means at the NFL level. But we do have, you know, last year and this year to go uh, really, you know, to compare it with because last year Trey Pipkins was god awful during the preseason. Storm Norton wasn't great either, but Brian Bulaga was still around at that point, right? So they didn't have to think about it as much as we're thinking about it now. And David, to me, I thought that Storm Norton played a little bit better. That being said, I still think this is a wide open battle and I think it's anybody's to win. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with you, actually. You know, when I was watching and I watched both of those guys very, very closely and, you know, th there really isn't much separation there. I mean, no. they both look like they are much better football players totally. than they were a year ago. There is no question about that. There is growth on both sides. Um, and, you know, this is a stat here from PFF. It says Storm Norton and Trey, P Trey Pipkins. Norton did not allow a pressure in 10 pass blocking snaps, while Pipkins did allow one hurry in his nine pass blocking snaps. So that's what we're talking about as far as separation here or the lack thereof. There just really wasn't much to be able to distinguish these two guys. I thought both of them did a good job in, in pass protection and opening up some holes on the outside for the running backs as well. There just wasn't a whole lot here. And unfortunately, as much as we wanted to see that separation, it just hasn't happened yet. And it still could happen, but I think obviously, you know, that's the best case scenario. Somebody goes and just grabs that job, you know, by the neck and just takes it right and, and yeah. there's no doubt about who it should be we didn't get that through one preseason no. game nor did we necessarily think we would we thought it would no. be the best evaluation process that we've gotten so far you know besides you know one-on-ones with khalil mack and joey bosa which is always going to push you to your limits and it's hard to gauge because those dudes are so good yeah neither one of them was dominant neither one of them you know was just pancaking dudes left and right neither one of them you know just absolutely was burying dudes like they both did good for the most part. Trey Pipkins had one really bad rep, right? But compared to last year when there was, you know, two or three bad reps each series, that's a huge yeah. improvement for him. So he, he has improved a lot since the last time we saw him, especially in the preseason. I mean, we saw him play well in the regular season last year. The development is definitely happening there. With Storm Norton, I just felt like both were kind of the same in run blocking, neither one being totally physically dominant and neither one just brutally missing assignments right somewhere right. in the gray area in the middle pass blocking wise obviously storm norton didn't give up the pressure but i also just felt like he gave up less ground right than oh, trey pipkins did i agree uh, i think trey pipkins is the more smooth athlete but i think storm norton even though he's a little bit more methodical it seemed like his anchor was a little bit better in this game and you know as long as you stop the guy from getting near your quarterback it's fine but it just seemed yeah. like storm norton once he latched on in this game guys weren't going anywhere and that's obviously what you want and it's great to see that improvement from him as well because even if it is him that wins the job if he's a lot better than last year obviously he's not playing you know max crosby in this game it's going to be a lot better for your team especially offensively but i think the more interesting battles are happening on the defensive side david specifically with morgan fox and jerry tillery because that is one where we knew some things were going to be seen in this game and potentially some separation was going to be created and i think it did 
Absolutely it did. There's no question. I mean, if you look at Morgan Fox and his snaps and you look at Jerry Tillery and his snaps, they tell a completely different story. Jerry Tillery was getting knocked back repeatedly on every single run attempt, run defense attempt. He was getting moved out of the way. He was not effective at all. And unfortunately, that's what we saw a lot last year. That's what we saw a lot last year with Jerry Tillery. Now with Morgan Fox, he was he was making things happen. He, he got a couple of pressures in there. Uh, one of his pressures directly helped Chris Rumpf secure that sack. I mean, he was making plays. He That's what we thought we were going to get from Morgan Fox, a guy that is really just a specialist on as an interior pass rusher, and it showed. Uh, Morgan Fox definitely created some positive separation for himself after preseason game number one. Yeah, Morgan Fox had three pressures. Jerry Tillery had zero pressures. And when you're talking about them specifically, I mean, I didn't think either of them were groundbreaking in the running game in this game. I thought Morgan Fox was the better of the two. Didn't think either of them really stood out in that regard. But, I mean, having both of those dudes in there at the same time at defensive tackle, I mean, you're not really trying to stop the run with that uh-uh. formation, right? It seemed like it's like, <laughs> no. hey, we're going to put you both in there. We'll see who survives it. Kind Make of a play. Thing, right? Who's yeah, going to make a play? Let's see it. I think that Morgan Fox held up a little bit better against the run, but it was pass rushing where he had the clear advantage. He got those three pressures. He should have really got in credit for forcing two sacks. You know, yeah. Mecca Gouley and Chris Rump both don't whiff so hard oh, on Bryce Perkins. God, that was so terrible. But it was all forced by Morgan Fox, who in a very yeah. limited number of snaps got those three pressures and showed, hey, if there is a defensive pass rushing player on this team right now, he's obviously the leader in the clubhouse. So a lot of things can change. Jerry Tillery is a guy who can put together a game where he looks like, you know, an all-star player at times or at least put together 20 snaps where he looks like a really good player. We've seen that. It's always (laughs) been about consistency with Jerry Tillery, and it just doesn't seem like right now. I mean, Jerry Tillery is going into his fourth season. Like, he, these these guys are all good players, right? All all these even undrafted free agents and these reserve guys were most of them the best players on their college football team. Of course. It's not like these are any slouches, but when you're playing against the guys that Jerry Tillery has – going into his fourth season now like you should not be getting he should be around. dominating these guys totally. he, he, should, should he should absolutely be throwing them out of the especially way especially in pass rushing situations if absolutely. he gets 10 pass rushing snaps it, it just can't go down with zero pressures the way it did he couldn't fight through double teams in this game and it's just honestly yeah it sucks <laughs> it sucks yep. right now that you, you haven't seen that development right? because you keep waiting you know the potential is in there we haven't seen it, you know, a much different way so far. I mean, it's been pretty quiet in camp. He did have, you know, a couple of half sacks, I think, in training camp so far. Nobody had really stood out to that, you know, that point, including Morgan Fox. But after that game, I mean, it's decidedly the arrow is pointing more towards Morgan Fox, the guy that they brought in for that specific person to be an interior pass rusher. But it doesn't stop there, David, because I thought Braden Fehoko also deserves a shout out for his performance. And you look at it and it's one tackle, right? You know, and then you see all the you know pro football focus grades and stuff when we talked about that yesterday it's so hard to you know tell what these guys are even going off of especially when there is these run you know so these small sample sizes i should say but i kind of got it when he had such a high run defense grade from pff because even though he only had one tackle i think a lot of the runs didn't go at him it seemed like they were running away from him and it just seems like he holds up better especially against double teams he just seems like he gives up the least ground i still think he has a long way to go as far as a pass rushing perspective goes but as far as a run stuffing perspective, as far as being stout on the interior, I think he was the leader there over Christian Covington, who I also thought had a fine game. I didn't think he played bad. Braden Fehoko just continues to stand out to me. Braden Fehoko is just a presence. He, he is a presence in the middle of that defensive line, a presence that you really can't get around. You can't get through him. He might not always make the tackle. He might not always get to the ball carrier, but he is making it a lot easier for the guys around him to get to the ball carrier. And yeah. if you notice, you didn't really see any big runs. Uh, you didn't see any explosive runs. You didn't see any over probably five or six yards. That just that weren't just by the quarterback. No. Right. That weren't by the quarterback. Obviously, that just didn't really happen. And I think a large reason for that was because of that menacing, dominating force in the middle that was Braden Fehoko. Yeah, exactly. And it just seems like he continues to stand out. I mean, I'd be surprised if he doesn't make the team, you know, if, oh, yeah. if it ended tomorrow. Like, I think he would have to make the team. We'll see how it plays out. I'm sure he's going to get a lot of snaps these next couple of weeks, but I think he didn't do anything to hurt what has been a really, really strong off season for him so far. Absolutely. And it also, you know, his dad was up there doing crazy stuff on the jumbo Tron as well, which was awesome. <laughs> Shout out to see. senior Fay Hoko. God, man. you have to hope that it. that dude, you know, <laughs> makes the team, man. A very, very easy guy to root for, but 
talking about position battles, there's also a big position battle, I think, going up and down the wide receiving core after, you know, Keenan Allen and Mike Williams between Josh Palmer, DeAndre Carter, how involved is he going to be in the offense? Jalen Guyton, what is his role? Is he losing some of that role? We got to see all three of those guys, although very little in this last game. We're also going to talk about what the linebacking core looks like and a Xander Horvath signing, maybe him pulling away as fullback one. But I need to tell you guys about something that's great that I just found out about, and that is the Elias Game Plan app. It's almost the start of the NFL season. Obviously, I love this time of year. If you guys are into sports betting or fantasy, and you need a competitive edge to win. I have the Elias Game Plan app for you guys. It's the ultimate sports betting and fantasy companion for the NFL, NBA, and MLB. The Elias Game Plan is the only sports app with the most trusted names in sports stats, Elias Sports Bureau. The official statisticians of U.S. pro sports leagues, including the NFL, Obviously, they're the they're the goats of all of the information that you want, and that's obviously something very important to us. And their app lets you access the team and player stats, head-to-head team comparisons, and Elias insights from the Elias Sports Bureau's research team. This app is really your one-stop source for player news and league-validated player stats and team records, so you don't have to wonder if you're getting the right stats from two different websites, expert game analysis for betting, and building your fantasy team to crush that friend that keeps trash-talking you in all of your fantasy football leagues. In the perfect for the preseason to get the player previews and all the things you need going into the fantasy football season. So take my advice, download the Elias Game Plan app today. With the new features available all the time, take your game to the next level. The NFL season is right around the corner, so don't wait. Find the Elias Game Plan app in the App Store and the Play Store today. I also need to tell you guys something I never have a hard time talking about, and that is Built Bars, the best protein bar on the planet. And they still, guys, for now, have the cookie dough chunk puffs built bar the ones that are really goat status i think right now as far as you're getting something that has cookie dough in it and it's also going to fit on your diet and that's the thing about built bar is the taste really separates it to me it's nice i mean if you can find something that's 160 calories and has 15 grams of protein while also being low carb and low sugar that's great and it also has cookie dough in it and is 100 covered in chocolate and soft and easy to chew not hard to get behind that cause and built bars are their one-stop shop for the best tasting protein bars on the planet they even have a peanut butter lovers bundle on built.com right now a straight up peanut butter built bar is available right now i had never seen it before today it's on there a bundle of peanut butter i love peanut butter right right now you guys can save some money since you guys listen to this show you can go to built.com use the promo code locked 15 to get 15 percent off your order that's promo code locked 15 to get 15 percent off at built.com All right, David, well, we have a couple more position battles I want to update here. We're not going to get to running back today because we talked a lot about it yesterday. But the way we talked about it yesterday was basically Josh Kelly has taken some separation for RB2. Isaiah Spiller has taken some separation for RB3, right? So Kelly gained some ground probably on Spiller, but Spiller definitely gained some ground on Larry Roundtree as we see it. Larry Roundtree, only three carries, had the fumble in the practices, you know, leading up to the first preseason game. Stock down Larry Rantree, stock up both of those other guys for the most part. But I want to talk about the wide receiver battle and a weird one, David, because it's not like any of these guys as far as Jalen Guyton, Josh Palmer, or DeAndre Carter is going to make the team. But what those guys' roles in the offense, I think, is still a little bit in flux. I mean, Josh Palmer has been the early winner for that job, I think, as far as getting the third most receiving snaps as a wide receiver. But DeAndre Carter has come on really strong as well, right? I mean, he's been one of the most impressive offensive playmakers in training camp so far. I mean, I think he had six touchdowns, right, so far in training camp. We didn't really see anything from any of those guys in this game. DeAndre Carter only played 10 snaps in this game. Jalen Guyton and Josh Palmer only played 14 snaps each. Not great. Didn't get to see a ton. Jalen Guyton had two catches for six yards. That's about it. But it was just kind of weird, David. We didn't see more. It didn't seem like any of those guys were really on the same page with page with Chase Daniel. It seemed like that came later on when guys like Joe Reed, guys he had thrown two more were getting on the field, Michael Bandy being another one of those guys. But it is something that is still, I think, very much up in there. I don't think any of those guys did anything in this game that really changes where they are in this roster. 
No, because they didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah. They didn't do anything at all of note. I mean, uh, unfortunately, Josh Palmer and Chase Daniel were clearly not on this on the same page. There were a couple of different routes where the ball just seemed to be in an area that Josh Palmer was not there. I mean, they, or they just yeah, just thrown too quickly too, right. and the timing was was the very rhythm off. and timing was not there between Josh Palmer and Chase Daniel. Didn't now, think Josh Palmer was creating a bunch of separation though. Maybe it's a conversation for another time, but. Uh, most of those throws Josh Palmer was was very covered at least in my opinion yeah yeah I mean uh, that's probably that's probably true for sure uh unfortunately DeAndre Carter didn't really even get a target so don't really know what he why they why they didn't really feel the need to get him involved on offense or on the least snaps too that that was the weird thing he didn't take any kick returns back and then he got one less series than Josh Palmer and Jalen Guyton did Obviously, we haven't heard anything like injury wise or anything, but obviously when he's had such an exciting preseason or training camp to see him going to the preseason, we're like, what is he going to be able to do? Yeah, it was nothing. <laughs> yeah, I was excited. I mean, I was excited to see what one of these wide receivers were, were going to be able to do because Josh Palmer was the training camp dawning up to this point. We hadn't seen a whole lot from Jalen Guyton, so I wanted to see more from him. And DeAndre Carter, another you know just out of nowhere type of uh, darling here in training camp yeah, that for was sure. scoring all over the place. And then preseason game number one shows up and they don't really do anything at all. Yeah. So, I mean, this competition is still ongoing. I mean, and I think if anything, though, it shows you kind of they don't have a ton to think about with these guys, at least. I mean, as far as they're all going to make the team right between those three guys, all of them. It'd be a shocker if all those guys didn't make or any of those guys didn't make the team, any of those three. But we were a little shocked last year when Tyron Johnson didn't make the team. It's easy to forget now, but Tyron Johnson, at least in one Locked On Chargers host mind, was a lock to make this team last year. No, it was both of us, but only one of us wrote, hey, he's going to be wide receiver three in 2021. (laughs) Not the case. Didn't make the team. Ended up on the Raiders. But anyways, going back, I went back to last season to see, you know, how much Tyron Johnson was playing. And if there's one thing I learned from that, it's, Look at the second and third weeks of preseason more than you look at the first one, right? Because yeah. Tyron Johnson had 19 snaps in the first preseason game last year. So that's not much more than Jalen Guyton and Josh Palmer got in this game. But then in week two, he had 39. In week three, he had 47. Yeah. So th- that's going to be something to monitor. You know, how much these guys are playing in these later preseason games. Like, I think we're not going to see much more of guys like Asante Samuel Jr. and Michael Davis. I think that's all going to get hashed out in the practice field for the most part because both those dudes are important. Oh, and yeah. that, you know, and, and the first game seems to be when those guys kind of get a little bit more run, at least in Brandon Staley's one year career so far. So we'll see how much things have changed. But those numbers are something to definitely monitor going forward. I want to talk about the linebackers now, David, because it's not something where there's a ton of who's going to be LB3, right? It's not necessarily as straightforward as that. But I do think we saw some things of note from the linebackers. And I would say one of them. Troy Reader, I thought, looked really good, right? Yeah. Made some nice reads. Smoked a dude for a loss on a third and short. Yes, he Destroyed did. Destroyed Bryce Perkins on one play. He decided to run anywhere near the goal line. Made him pay. It was bad. And the other one, I think, <laughs> is Damon Lloyd. And I think yeah. there's two different storylines here. I think the first one is with Troy Reader. It's like, okay, well, maybe it's not doom and gloom if he has to get some snaps for this defense. Absolutely, right? yeah. Because the one thing you know about him, he does look like he knows exactly where he's supposed to be that, in this that's defense. That's for sure. He fits in nicely. Yes, and then there's Damon Lloyd, right? A guy who missed all of last season with an injury, trying to make it as an undrafted free agent. Yeah, good Gets story. another chance this year. Has a huge training camp. Has been, you know, maybe the most impressive linebacker consistently throughout training camp. And I think follows it up with a very good game in the preseason. Six tackles in three stops, according to Pro Football Focus, which means, you know, a, a tackle that's happening near the line of scrimmage and is thought of as a positive for the defense. So those are the two things as far as linebackers, even though, they're different things and not really fighting for certain spots. I think still important storylines to follow. Well, it, it is important because there's so many just in, uh, injuries and uncertainty in the linebacker room right now. Yeah, you just you can say that you don't, you don't know what's up with Drew Tranquil. You don't know when Kenneth Murray is going to come back or what version of Kenneth Murray we're going to see. So it is. It was definitely nice. 
for me to see Troy Reader out there and really look the part. I mean, that, that's one thing that kind of put my mind a little bit at, at ease because we all get sucked into the grades and, and the stats. And, you know, we all look at that and that's how we kind of, you know, we weigh how players are going to do. But when we when I watched Troy Reader out there, I'm like, OK, you know, this guy actually looks the part and he looks like he fits in this defense. So maybe it's not all bad. And then for Damon Lloyd, a very good story here and a guy that has taken that production from training camp and manifested it out there in preseason game number one. The only thing that he can do is go out there and try to rack up as many tackles, as many splash plays as he possibly can, because it's not his job to figure out or know what's going on in front of him. He just has to go up out, go out there and make plays and make it as difficult as possible for the Chargers coaching staff to cut him. Well, it's not just the the injuries, you know, higher up on the depth chart, like the Drew Trank was and a Kenneth Murray, right? We didn't see Amen or Nick Neiman in this game. That's and true. those are the dudes at the bottom of the linebacker chart. So, like, yeah. there could be something there. I think the team likes Bong a lot. I think Nick Neiman plays a very important role on special teams. Uh, he definitely did for them last year, but they're, you know, what's the the shiniest thing on a terrible car, right? Like, <laughs> it, it wasn't a good unit at all. So, it's hard to say, but maybe one of those spots up for grab. I think at the very least, he's definitely earning himself a lot of conversations about trying to keep this dude around in some capacity, yes. whether that's on the training camp, keeping him away, or in the practice squad, keeping him away from other teams. But a couple more things we don't get have time to get into really today. I mean, I think the edge rusher, at least if there is a fifth edge rusher, including Kyle Van Noy, Emeka Igbue, and Jamal Davis had a nice little game as far as trying to prove what they can do. Emeka had an up and down game, missed a couple of tackles, but also had seven pressures, which is like Joey Bosa only had a handful of games with seven pressures in a game last year, obviously playing much better. He got people. there a lot. He just didn't finish the plays. And that's the, totally. the most frustrating part of watching a Mecca sure. game. But if you're going to say that about Dean Leonard, though, right, that he's in the right position and isn't getting his head around, then what's to stop you from using that same logic with the Mecca boy, right? No, for sure. Hey, yeah, it's get frustrating. past the offensive tackle first. Yeah. And then we'll figure out everything else. I mean, he did Absolutely. that. He caused chaos in the backfield, but he also made three tackles and missed three tackles. So yeah. that's not going to get it done. And that was amongst a sea of missed tackles as well. But we do, I want to talk about, you know, Xander Horvath. And we'll just end the show with this, David. I mean, is Xander Horvath after his preseason performance now the front runner for fullback one? Yeah, I mean, I think I think so right now. Just looking at, at what he did in the game, he had a couple of good blocks. <laughs> he got that handoff on the fourth down, uh, the fourth, the sh fourth and short, and he converted that. Showed some good hands, um, and, and you know, showed some athleticism out there. I think in game number two, let's get him some more carries, man. Let's see what he can do as a ball carrier. Oh, yeah. You know, maybe uh, you know, hey, it's all about the weapons and all about trying to figure out how what all your weapons are capable of doing. And Xander Horvath is trying to become one of them. So, I mean, he played 11 snaps. Gabe Neighbors played two snaps. And there's a couple of different ways to look at that. I mean, Gabe Neighbors, they know what he is at this point. He's going, what, going into his third season now. So, yeah. it's like there's not a lot of mystery with Gabe Neighbors. There's definitely some intrigue around Xander Horvath. And it seems like they would want to, you know, explore all of those yeah. avenues with him. And I think we'll continue to see him. 11 snaps for a team who doesn't use a ton of fullback is not, not bad for Xander Horvath. And they made the most of it. He had, a, you know, a nice catch, but couldn't get a first down. The one time he did get a catch, I think he intentionally came up short so he could get the handoff on fourth and one and convert of that. Of course. <laughs> but we saw him, I mean, earlier in the week, I told everyone when I went to practice, one thing they were doing, they were working on third and short situations. And on third and one, they, with the first team offense, put Xander Horvath in there and he picked it up. So that is definitely something he's very capable of doing. It was not flashy at all. He gained like two yards, but he did it with violence. And I mean, that's the thing. That I don't care if it's exciting. flashy. And he but did it, was it with effective. a mustache, you know, and that's another thing that you care about. <laughs> and he'll probably hurdle the line of scrimmage when everyone thinks he's going to put his head down one of these times and take off for like a 60-yard touchdown. So stock please, up for I Xander Horvath. That, he's going to give us some unforgettable moments, you know, in this preseason, I think, and hopefully in the regular season as well because the dude is just some freak show of a thing, and they're still trying to figure out what to do with it. But that is going to wrap things up for today's show. On tomorrow's show, very excited to be getting into an article done by Daniel Popper. Our friend Daniel Popper, our friend Pop, came out with a groundbreaking story about how Brandon Staley decides to go for all these fourth downs. It was immaculate. We're going to be back here tomorrow to talk about that mindset and what Brandon Staley is trying to do to stop the Chargers from charging. He's not the first one to try it. He may be the first one to actually get it done, but to make sure you don't miss it, Go subscribe to the Lockdown Chargers YouTube channel and also follow the show for free on all platforms wherever you get your podcasts from. 
Me and David also post the show to all of our social media every day. So you can find me on Twitter at Dan Talk Sports and David Drogemeyer on Twitter at Drotalk SD. And his DMs are always open. You can also find the show's page at Locked On LAC. And we post the show there as well. And on our Locked On Chargers Facebook page and at Locked On Chargers on Instagram as well. If you guys want to get your voicemails in, we are going to be trying to do a fan mail show soon. Make sure you call in to 323 524 7924. But that's going to do it for us today. We will be back here tomorrow talking about fourth and stately. Until then, take it easy and go bolts.